Nights, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. And yes, this is indeed Sunday night scripture. However, we're recording this on Thursday night because uh, me and my brother Dom are going to need a couple more weeks off, a couple more Sundays off. But of course, we didn't want to not continue in the Revelation roller coaster ride. So what we've decided to do is to record this on Thursday night, upload it, and of course, uh, watch it at your leisure on my YouTube channel. Okay. So just for clarification, uh, we're taking this August 27th off and September 3rd off, and we will resume as per usual for the live uh, Zoom context on uh, September 10th. All right. That's when we're going to resume for live. However, we're going to continue to record and uh, pop a video up and uh, so that you have something to watch uh, again at your leisure. If you prefer it on uh, Sunday night or Monday, whatever it is at your leisure, of course. So thank you guys for your patience on that. And, um, and of course, thank you for listening to this video. We're going to continue, as I said, in the Revelation roller coaster ride. We're walking into Revelation chapter 21, and we're going to cover verses 9 to 14 today. And I want to kind of recalibrate my main goal here in this book of Revelation series. Of course, as you go through it, you try to explain things as best as you can, and there might be some theological positioning in there. But primarily, my main goal is for people to see that the book of Revelation is historical. And um, certainly, I think I made a really good point, I believe, anyways, in from chapter 1 to 19. And I think a lot of people are saying, yeah, this is starting to make sense. I'd like to keep that in the repertoire. And then, of course, I separated chapter 20 to 22 because there are some folks who suggest that there's material in there that might yet be for the future. However, when I went through my process and, and tried to study in all the, the different directions, it once again seemed to be pointing to me as a completed work. All right. And I'm going to suggest that Revelation 21 verse 9 to 14 is all about the church that was established in the first century. And if that is true, and if I am accurate when I give you the interpretation, then that would suggest strongly that Revelation 21 is fulfilled because I'm going to say it again. It's not about a future church that's going to be established one day. It's about Jesus, the Messiah, Yeshua, the Christ, along and then eventually, of course, the apostles and the first century churches that established the church. That's what Revelation 21 verses 9 to 14 is primarily about. And I think if that is the case, and I'm going to make a really good case for it, hope you're tuning into this, at least give me a shot. And if that is the case, then Revelation 21 is not future. It's also fulfilled. And if Revelation 21 is fulfilled, then Revelation 20 is fulfilled. And I'm going to suggest to you, we only have one more chapter to go. So once again, I think I'm making uh, my attempt here is to make a good case for the historical view of the book of Revelation. All right, so let's not waste any more time. Uh, that's my intention. You know what it is. So let's see if I can prove it. And so here we are, folks, Revelation 21. And we're going to start here in verse 9. And uh, we're going to talk about verse 9 and 10 to start. Okay, so it says, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me saying, come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. All right. So this angel is showing John the bride, the lamb's wife. We know what the bride is. We're going to see some scriptures, but we know most Sunday um, pulpits will tell you that us, God-fearing Jesus Christ, believing Christians, we are the lamb's wife, right? That's what they'll say. We are the bride. Okay, when did this get established? Well, I'm going to suggest to you this got established in the first century. All right. And of course, now we got to see what he shows John. And then you will see that that is the bride, that that is the lamb's wife, because that's what he says. I'm going to show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And what did he show him? Right here. And he showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So it's not a physical city. If this is the bride, if this is the lamb's wife, it's the church. That's what the great city is. That's what the holy Jerusalem is. Do you see that? And I'm going to read this from the front here where it says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. And 
so I'm going to suggest to you Mount Sion. Where is this high mountain? The heavenly Jerusalem. And he showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And I'm going to suggest to you, for example, right, if A equals B and B equals C and C equals D and D equals 7, then basically A equals 7, B equals 7, C equals 7, D equals 7. So what I'm suggesting to you is that's what we have here. If the bride is the church and the bride is the lamb's wife, then the bride and lamb's wife is the church. If the bride and lamb's wife is the great city and the bride and lamb's wife is the holy Jerusalem and the bride and lamb's wife is the church, well, then the great city and the holy Jerusalem is the church. So these are all different word pictures for the church, which was established in the first century. And just in case, guys, sometimes we take it for granted, but th this word picture is often used in scripture. So I'm going to show you a couple. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. For I am jealous over you, Paul writes, with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband. I've married you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. All right, that's where we get that term, the bride of Christ. John 3, 29, and this is actually sometimes this gets overlooked, but John the Baptist, I believe, is borrowing, if you will, in this word picture from Isaiah and probably several other locations, I would suggest as well. I think it's in Hosea as well, but I'm going to show you John 3, 29, and I'm going to show you Isaiah 62, verse 5. And John the Baptist is talking about Jesus and the church here in advance at the front end of Jesus's ministry. And he says, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom. Okay, so the bride is the church. The bridegroom is Jesus. But the friend of the bridegroom, he's speaking of himself there because he came to make the way for the Lord, right? He's the voice crying out from in the wilderness, if you will. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This, my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. And do you see that term fulfilled there? And I'm going to suggest the bridegroom's voice that he's speaking of is when Jesus talks about, I believe it's in John 5, that the dead will hear my voice, right? And they will rise. All right. So something to keep in mind. But again, our main thing here is to prove bride church. And this was, I believe he borrowed, this is one of the places he borrowed the word picture from the symbolism from where it says in Isaiah 62, 5, for as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy son's children marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. And of course, these children, right? These sons that marry, right? These are the children of God. Um, just like it's all word picture, it's all symbol, just like a young man that marries a virgin, right? All right, so I think we've covered that. I just wanted to give you a few witnesses on that one. Okay, and we're going to go back now to Revelation 21. And we're going to continue now. And you're going to see that verse 11 is further word picture describing the church. All right. And we're going to show you here how he's talking about the glory of God. We're going to show you scriptures. Uh, he's talking about her light and he's talking about the bride's light, Holy Jerusalem's light, which is all about the church. And a most precious stone is also going to be included in this. And you're going to see how the New Testament epistles describe the church and Christ and use these word pictures and the good works and things of this nature to point to the church, what she does and what she collects, if you will. Okay. And, but again, I'm going to say that if this is about the establishment of the church in the first century, then this is fulfilled. Okay. So it says having the glory of God. So what has the glory of God? The Holy Jerusalem has the glory of God, which is the great city, which is the lamb's wife, which is the bride, which is the church. All right. So the church having the glory of God and her light. So that's the church's light was like unto, and here's your comparative or your analogy was like unto a stone, most precious, even like a Jasper stone, clear as crystal. All right. So let's talk about this 
symbolism, because we know that the book of Revelation is loaded with symbolism, and let's see if we can't find some stuff in the New Testament epistles that describes the holy Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, which is the church, um, describes it saying that it has the glory of God. And I'm going to suggest to you we have several scriptures that will prove that. Galatians 1, 20 to 24. Now, the things which I write unto you, uh, let me set this up a little bit. This is where Paul is explaining how he used to persecute the church when he, his name was Saul, and he used to persecute the believers of Christ Yeshua, Christ Jesus. And eventually, he gets converted to preaching Christ Yeshua. Okay, so that's the context here. And he's explaining this to the Galatian church. He says, now the things which I write, write unto you, behold, before God, I lie not. Afterwards, I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia and, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. So they didn't know me. They didn't see my face. However, they heard about me. That's what he's saying here. But they heard only that he which persecuted, past tense, us in times past, now preaches the faith which he once destroyed. And look what he says here. And they glorified God in me. They glorified God in me. Do you see that? It was to God's glory that Saul became Paul. He went from persecuting the church to preaching the church, if you will, in the good news and the gospel. Do you see the difference there? And the so who has the glory of God, right? God put the glory in, right? He was glorified in the church, in Paul, okay? So hopefully I explained that well, but this is going to be even more clear here in 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, okay? The glory of the Lord, having the glory of God, are changed into the same image, see? We become Christ-like, Christ being formed in you, the Spirit of God, the Spirit that's in you has you operating in the Spirit of Christ. Therefore, you have the glory of God, right? The glory of God, right, is in the church. That's why he says the new Jerusalem having the glory of God. Who has the glory of God? Right? It's God's glory, but he gives it to who? The church. So are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So it's the Spirit of the Lord, right, that is changing, if you will, right, changing you into the image of Christ, right, and Christ's church, if you will, okay? Um, 1 Peter 4.14, if you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you for the Spirit of glory and of God right? The glory and of God. So the glory of God, the spirit of God resteth upon you. See? So who has the glory of God? The believers. Who's that? The church. Who's that? New Jerusalem. Okay. Who is that? The church. When was that established? See, he's not saying one day God's <laughs> glory is going to rest upon you. He's saying to them at that time, God's glory rests on you. And by the way, it rests on them because they're being reproached for the name of Christ. And by the way, he says, happy are you, <laughs> right? So we need to understand this, that he's saying, if you're being reproached for Christ, happy. Why? Because the glory of God is on you. That's what he's saying. So who has the glory of God? The church. On their part, this is very clear here, on their part, meaning the people who are doing the persecuting, he, meaning God, is evil spoken of. Oh, you bunch of... Bible thumping, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. You believe in Christ. He's not the resurrected king. He's not the chief cornerstone, right? They're speaking, you're, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I don't have to go into too many details, but then he says, but on your part, he is glorified. So God is glorified by them taking the hits for preaching Christ, loving Christ. God and walking in the spirit of Christ. They persecuted Christ. They persecuted them. They have the glory of God upon them. God is glorified when people are willing to stand up for righteousness sake, even if it means it costs them their reputation, even if it might 
cause them. Um, it shouldn't do that, but unfortunately, if you will, there's opposition. Okay. So continuing this theme that the church has the glory of God, and we see that in the New Testament epistles, and therefore the symbology that we're seeing is just symbolizing the church that has the glory of God. And he says, Ephesians 1, 12 to 13, he, he says, and I want to be very specific, he's actually talking about the, the apostles specifically, the first ones who trusted in Christ. So try not to stick yourself completely in there. All right. Paul's writing to the Ephesian church and he says that we, meaning them, should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. And I don't mean this offensively, but you didn't trust in Christ, best as I know, before Peter, John, James, Paul, or the Ephesian church right? So he's being very specific when he's telling this Ephesian church that we, meaning the, the apostles, for example, maybe the first prophets, maybe the people from the Feast of Pentecost, the ones who first trusted in Christ, that we should be the praise of his glory. So they have God's glory, okay? Then he says, in whom you also trusted. That's how I know he's talking about themselves, if you will, the apostles and the main, the first ones who trusted Christ first. And now these people have come along, if you will, in whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Okay. So again, you're seeing the praise of God's glory in who? In the ones who first trusted Christ, Christ, and now the ones who also now have heard these words from the apostles, and now the glory of God rests upon them. And it has continued since the first century. And so we continue here in Ephesians 3, verses 20 to 21. And the, uh, the writer Paul says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. So that's God's spirit working in them, correct? Unto him be glory where? In the church. Do you see that? His glory and it's in the church. God's glory is in the church, right? And how? Through or by Christ Jesus, right? Throughout all ages, throughout all ages. If anyone is telling you that there's only one Christian age, that, quite frankly, flies right in the face of that. No, there's several Christian ages that began 2,000, approximately 2,000 years ago. And then it says, world without end, amen. And it's very, very clear. So if the if this is about the church which it is clearly and about the glory of God being in the church, right, throughout all ages, then what Revelation 21 verses 9 to 14, and we covered verses, verse 11 right now, is talking about what? The glory of God in the church. Well, not at, the glory of God doesn't come at the end of time. Therefore, Revelation 21 verse 11 must be about the first century establishment of the church where God's glory is in the church. That's what it has to be. It can't be at the end of time, right? It can't be because it's about the church and the glory of God in the church. And that was established in the first century. So Revelation 21 verse 11 is about the historic establishing of the church, which now we are enjoying one of many Christian ages that have already passed, and I believe that are going to continue because it is plural, okay? And it does say world without end, okay? All right, I think we did a pretty good job in covering the glory of God. Now let's go back and it talks about her light, correct? It says having the glory of God and her light, speaking about the bride, the holy Jerusalem, right? And her light. Okay, so let's go see some scriptures that talk about the light being the church, and therefore that was established 2,000 years ago. It's not her light is going to be something one day because the church was established already 2,000 years ago, and it continues. And that's what Ephesians 3.21 is telling us. All right, so let's go here to see some light scriptures and where that's where that's at. And this is as early as in Matthew 5. I think they call this um, the um, Sermon on the Mount. And in verses 14 to 17, look what Jesus says. He says, you are the light of the world. 
See, he is the light of the world, but it's extended through his spirit to the people who love God and believe in Christ and operate in the spirit of God and Christ. So he says, you are the light of the world, her light. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Notice the city. He's already referencing the holy Jerusalem, which is in Revelation 21. He's already talking about the what? The great city the Holy Jerusalem. He's already beginning to communicate this word picture to his people, to the people that were listening to him speak. It's very clear there. You see the light and you see the city, right? And that's what he calls them. He's already referencing that word picture, that symbolism. And by the way, he says it cannot be hid, all right? Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, right? So you're not supposed to bury the church and the light of the church and the glory of God, which is in the church, you're supposed to be shining that light, right? By telling people the truth, by operating in the truth through love, mercy, grace, and the goodness that God has committed um, through Christ and the apostles of the first century. And it's continued since then. And now through us in our age. All right. And it says, and he says, but instead you put it on a candlestick and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men. See the light reference that they may see your good work. So part of your belief, part of your faith it inspires you part of that grace and mercy that you receive by God, that light is in you now and through your good works, they can physically right now see, hey, that's a unique group there. And look what it says here, and glorify your father, which is in heaven. So what glorifies God? The light, the church, and particularly it's noticed from others when they see your good works, he says to them. And I would suggest we're supposed to continue that baton, if you will. Now, I included this for a specific reason, because look what he says next. Think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So I'm asking you, did he fulfill it or not? You're going to have to make that decision. But if you and I are claiming to be God-fearing, Jesus Christ-believing Christians under the new covenant, which was promised once the old covenant was fulfilled and part of that promise was ushering in the new covenant, then if we're under the new covenant, he fulfilled the law and the prophets. He brought that to an end by fulfilling it. And he began and instituted, if you will, was the chief cornerstone of the new covenant. And that's why he's the mediator. And that's why he's the high priest of the new covenant. And that's why he's a chief cornerstone. That's why he's the beginning, beginning of the new covenant and the end of the old covenant. All right. Let's continue seeing some other scriptures about the light of the church, right? While you have light, Jesus says, believe in the light, that you may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. All right. So again, he's saying that you may be the children of light. He's already preparing the extension from him to his apostles and to the prophets of the first century and the churches of the first century. And then, of course, it's extended since then. Second Corinthians 4, 6, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined where? In our hearts right? The light of Christ, the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ, the church in your heart is where the light is. Why? Why did he do that? To give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. So what are you seeing here? You're seeing the light and the glory of God in who? And he says, in our hearts, and he's speaking to this Corinthian church. So he's talking about them and, of course, the other believers in the first century. Therefore, when you go to Revelation 21 and you see light, glory, light and the glory of God, and, of course, that's in the bride, it's the establishment of the, in the first century of the new covenant church. Okay? And therefore... It's historical. All right. Let's continue here and see what else we got. 
Romans 13, 12. Um, I don't mind saying I do have a Romans 13 uh, video version two. It's the one that I believe that uh, is talking, Romans 13 is talking about the embassy of Christ. Um, but I'm, I don't want to get distracted. Look what he says here. He says, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us, let us, the church, put on the armor of light. It's the same symbology that you're seeing in Revelation 21, verse 11. Philippians 2, 14 to 15. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God or the children of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights, plural, in the world. That's the purpose right? So it is very, very clear, right? That if you are seeing this, that the light that is shining in the world that Revelation 21 is talking about is talking about the church in the first century. And of course, it's going to continue to build. And we saw that in Ephesians 23, verse, excuse me, chapter three, verse 20 and 21. And that's what, and it's clear that it came true. How do we know? 2,000 years later, folks, how many generations since the first century? If our chronology is accurate, several generations, right? So the church has continued and will continue, okay? Um, let's, and again, proving what's my main goal here is to show you that Revelation chapter 21, verses 9 to 14 is historical because it's based on the establishment of the church in the first century. And if it's established, which clearly it is, Therefore, Revelation 21 is historical. I'm going to keep repeating that because, again, that's, I think, the main goal here. And then you'll understand the book of Revelation better, in my opinion. All right, so now we want to go to the most precious stone part, okay, where he says, um, having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, most precious stone, right? And he describes it, right, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal. All right, so where do we see this type of thing? Well, before we move forward to show you some other scriptures, I'm going to keep you in Revelation 21 for a second. Just further ahead at verse 19, it says, And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of what? Precious stones. Okay. And it lists off the first foundation was and starts listing that off. Okay. But my main thing is he's saying that the foundation of the wall of the city is garnished with all manner of precious stones, right? Now, 2114, which we're going to get to today, says what? And the wall of the city had 12 foundations and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So how many foundations in this vision? 12. Who are they, right? Because it's not a physical building; it's a spiritual one. Who are the founding? Who are in the foundations? The twelve apostles. Who are they? When were they around? In the first century. So this wall of the city, that's the foundations of the wall of the city, is the apostles. We're not. You and I are not the foundation, right? They were the foundation. That's very, very clear. Now, was that foundation established? Well, of course, every, every single Jesus Christ believer says, well, of course, shade. And I go, well, then Revelation 21, 14 fulfilled. Revelation 21, 19 fulfilled. Because it's not about us. It's about them and what they did in the first century. Okay? That's what we, ha you have to accept that. If not, you're saying that those 12 apostles are not in the foundation. And they didn't, they didn't, they're not part of the foundation or they haven't done the foundation yet. But I'm going to suggest to you, I'm going to repeat these, do this for your own homework. Colossians 1, 5 and 6, Colossians 1, 23, Romans 10, 18, all three, three witnesses where Paul writes that they had preached the gospel to the entire um, world at that time. They completed their work too. Okay. We continue to build upon what they founded. And that's what's been going on for 2,000 years almost, okay? So do I have any more precious stone um, analogy, most precious stones? I've got some here for sure, okay? We've used this scripture many times, but of course, I think sometimes people miss this. 
precious stones. What are these precious stones that are garnishing the foundations? Might I suggest it's the good works, the good preaching, okay? So the apostles preach the gospel, do good works, shine the light in the world. Those are precious stones. And then people who receive that gospel, right, they continue to preach and operate in the light of Christ. And now they're garnishing the spiritual house with precious stones, precious good works, exposing evil, helping the oppressed, helping the afflicted, um, doing good in their family, right? Walking in the light and the love of God in Christ and walking in the doctrine, which is, I'm going to say it again, really study First Timothy and really study Titus, all kinds of doctrine in there. It's what we do and it's what we don't do. And those are the precious stones. And that's what this is. And so you use the precious stones here in First Corinthians and you apply it to Revelation. I'm going to suggest something to you. Part of the reason why people miss this, I believe, is pretty simple, actually. It's because they keep telling you it's for the future. That's why. So if I point to, oh, I don't know, some dining room chairs, and I say, these chairs actually belong to someone on another street, right? And then there's a dining room table in the other room, and there's a dining room table, and there's chairs that are missing there. You'll just go, well, but these chairs can't be for that because they told me that it was for some other person on another street. Meanwhile, the whole time it's looking at you right in the face going, no, no, no. <laughs> They're just steering you in the wrong direction. Those chairs belong to that table. Kind of a lame example. But what I'm trying to say is if they keep telling you that Revelation 21 is for the future, it's harder for you to see that they're using all the same word pictures in the epistles. And we're going to use them right here. We're going to show you. And you're going to see the building analogy too. It's all right there staring at us in the face. And he's talking about them at that time and what continues to occur because they're establishing the church. Okay. That's what they're doing. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. You are the great city. You are the holy Jerusalem. You see what he's saying there? According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise, what does he call himself? Master builder, right? Because he's what? He's building the spiritual house through the preaching and through the spirit of God and the spirit of Christ. Okay. And he owns it here, by the way. He says, I, Paul writes, have laid the foundation. Okay. And he did. But he doesn't not give Christ his, the, the due, the, the, the due, the due, position here, but he's saying Christ did what he did. And then he, uh, through the grace of God, now I'm doing what I'm doing. And that's why he instructs Timothy and Titus to continue as he instructs, instructs all the church to continue, all of the churches to continue. He says, I have laid the foundation. Notice that he's using the term foundation and another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he builds. Okay, so it's very, very clear. And he says, and for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. By the way, a little side note, guys. Jesus the Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, is the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone, whether people believe it or not. He is. That's just the deal. So if two plus two is four, someone else saying that it's not doesn't change the fact that it is. So remember that. That might give you some, some patience when you're talking to people. We'll continue. And it says, now, if any man build upon this foundation, and you're going to see gold, by the way, in, in the city as well, gold, silver, and precious stones. Do you see that? Okay. He's talking about what? He's talking about their works. Okay. Wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. And by the way, in verse eight, you see the lake of fire. Okay. And good works are revealed in that too, right? Because a precious stone, right? Is a precious stone. It'll, it'll be revealed. It'll be beautiful. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Okay. And again, he's using word picture here, guys. So it's not necessarily like extremely literal, but I think that's the picture. And we're supposed to be able to relate to it because we're supposed to know that gold, is, for example, is purified in what? Fire. We're supposed to know that silver needs to be purified, right? And the dross rises to the top and they scoop out the, more, the impurities. When we cook our meals, we don't want to cook the steak, you know, burnt to a crisp, but we do want to make sure that those impurities are gone so that, it, that we can eat them. Okay. 
And of course, it says, if any man's work abide which he hath built, you're seeing that building, that spiritual house being built, that holy Jerusalem thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Okay. If any man's work shall be burned, that's that fire idiom, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Okay, so the precious stones I'm going to suggest are the good works of the first century saints. And of course, we're supposed to continue building that spiritual house. All right, let's continue here and see what Peter talks about when he talks about precious stones. And you're going to, I think you're going to see the, uh, the relationship here. All right. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance, notice the term inheritance, reward, right? Incorruptible. See, that can't be an earthly thing if it's incorruptible because everything on earth has a timeline. And undefiled and that fadeth not away. And where is it reserved? In heaven for you. That's where it's reserved, folks, right? That's where the inheritance is reserved. If it's reserved there, then it doesn't come to the earth. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay. I hope you do because that's where it's reserved. So it's either reserved there or it's not. Now he's speaking at that time to them. We can glean from this to say, oh yeah. And that's where our inheritance that's incorruptible and undefiled that fades not away is. We shouldn't be assuming, well, that's there for them. Well, 2,000 years, I'm going to suggest to you it's been for everyone since, okay? Um, everyone who gets the inheritance, by the way, just to be clear there. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, okay? Ready to be revealed, all right? So what last time was he talking about? The end of the Mosaic age because they were establishing the church under the new covenant and the beginning of the Messianic age from mosaic age last of that beginning of the everlasting covenant for christian ages that are going to continue because it's a world without end amen okay wherein you greatly rejoice though now for a season if need be you are in heaviness through manifold temptations that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes so he's saying your faith is precious and he's comparing it to gold that is less precious because it perishes, right? So precious faith, I would suggest he's suggesting is a much more valuable precious stone, if you will, more so than gold that perishes. And that's what he's doing. That's what he's using here for the analogy. And he says, though it be tried with fire, gold is tried by fire, but he's talking about your faith or their faith, right? And he says, might be found unto praise and honor. And what does he say? And glory, right? So when your faith is tested, right, and it's tried, right, then that actually produces glory to God when you tough through those difficulties, okay? <clears throat> At the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, in whom though now you see him not, and I just did a video about the kingdom of God does not come with observation. They believe in Christ, though he, they don't see him. And that's us, right? We don't physically see Jesus, right? But we see him with the eyes of faith, right? Yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and what? Full of glory. You guys are full of glory because you believe in Jesus, even though you don't see him right now. You see that? And there's the glory talk. Glory, light, precious stone, in the church. Continuing here, 1 Peter 2. I'm going to take a sip of water here, guys. <clears throat> Excuse me. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby if so be you have tasted that the lord is gracious to whom coming as unto a living stone okay you're going to see how peter uses the same type of imagery disallowed indeed of men but chosen of god and precious he's talking about christ you also as lively stones do you see that imitate right imitate 
the spirit of Christ, Christ be formed in you, right? You are built up a what? Spiritual house, okay? It's not physical, spiritual. And holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by or through Jesus Christ. Wherefore, also, it is contained in the scripture. And I'm going to suggest to you, he's about to reference Psalm 18, Psalm 118, excuse me, 22, and eventually also Isaiah 8, 14. So you might want to take that down for your notes. Um, it's contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Sion, a chief cornerstone, elect and precious. He just called Jesus a precious chief cornerstone. Okay. And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. So if the spirit of Christ are in them, that's how you know the precious stones is an analogy, if you will, of those who have the spirit of Christ in them, spirit of God in them, because the church was established. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is what? Precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. Okay, so again, that chief cornerstone reference and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. They will be what? Kings and priests of God, right? And then look what he says here, an holy nation. An holy nation? How, he's talking to a bunch of believers, they're a nation? Did they buy a piece of property somewhere? No. They're the spiritual house. They are what? The great city, the holy Jerusalem. They're the holy nation. Do you see? He's saying the same type of word picture here that we see in Revelation 21. It's the same thing. And who is he talking to? He's talking to the church and the believers in the first century. That's what you're seeing in Revelation 21. It's the same thing. And he continues, he's a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness. And now you get the other analogy into his marvelous light. What do you see in Revelation 20? Light, glory of God, holy nation, heavenly Jerusalem, great city, precious stone. Okay. And remember, don't forget, he says you also as lively stones. Okay. So that same type of word picture. All right. Hopefully we've done a good job with that. And now we're going to continue here taking on 12 and 13. Okay. And uh, 12 and 13, I think, again, timelines it to um, Ezekiel. Okay. And uh, a completed, fulfilled prophecy. Okay. So check this out. It says here in Revelation, and I'm going to suggest to you a first century Jewish person would read this. Let's say if it was around 55 to 62 AD, anywhere in that zone, they go, they would say, hey, this is Ezekiel 48. This is how Ezekiel ends. That's what they would say. But if I tell you it's in the future, you won't even think about Ezekiel 48 because I've pointed you in the wrong direction. Do you see? I'm going to suggest that that's the case here. Okay. And I'm not saying people are doing it on purpose, but if people believe it's a future book and you're told that it's a future book, then you're going to think it in a future tense. And then you might not be going, well, wait a minute. Doesn't Ezekiel talk about this? And then you're going to forget also that Jesus said all things would be fulfilled. See? We're going to talk about that too. And and had a wall. So he's talking about the city and it had a wall great and high and had 12 gates and at the gates, 12 angels, the names written thereon, which are what? The names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Okay. Sounds like first century stuff to me. On the east gate, three, or excuse me, on the east, three gates, on the north, north, excuse me, three gates, on the south, three gates, and on the west, three gates. All right. So north, east, west, and south, three gates times four, 12 gates, 12 tribes of the children of Israel. All right. Now let's go to Ezekiel 48 verses 31 to 35. And I'm going to skip some of the numbers just for timeline. He says, and the gates of the city shall be this is a prophet now, after the names of the tribes of Israel. Three gates northward. Then over here he says, and at the east side, three gates. And he lists them. And on the south side, three gates. And then he lists them. And at the west side, three gates. And then he lists them. Okay? 
And then he says, it was round about 18,000 measures. I could say some stuff about that, but I'm going to leave it for now because that's, I want to stay focused. And the name of the city, and he's talking about the great city, right? Which is the church, guys. It's the new Jerusalem. It's the holy nation. From that day shall be the Lord is there. Is the Lord spirit, right? What did Jesus say? God is spirit, right? So. Remember, folks, that a lot, even lots of folks say this, and I think I agree with this, by the way. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. They couldn't see it at that time, okay? But the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So when you read the Old Testament now, read it understanding fully the spiritual heavenly Jerusalem and kingdom that Jesus came to establish in the first century, right? Then you won't. You won't get confused reading the Old Testament because you actually have the in. You know what he's talking about here. He's not talking about a physical land and a physical city. He's talking about the spiritual kingdom that Jesus came to establish. That's what he's talking about. They didn't know that back then, but they were preaching and teaching that in the first century. And because people have gone back to the carnal land, they are now once again seeing it all with carnal eyes. And they're actually repeating and thinking the exact same things that the first century Pharisees and chief priests said, show us the kingdom of God. Show it. Come on. When's that supposed to come? We need to see it. Where is it? He goes, it doesn't come with observation. Neither will you say low here or low there. What are, what are Christians saying today? Oh no, it's over there, guys. It's going to be over there pretty soon, pretty soon. No, but you're saying low here, low there. It's a spiritual kingdom. And that's why I did that. Um, but what about all the evil video that in the, JPEG, if you will, it says the kingdom of God does not come with observation. I fail to see how that ever changes. And you don't have a qualifier for it. We're supposed to continue building the spiritual house. Okay, let's continue because you can clearly see the three gates, right? Three gates, three gates, three gates, 12, right? He talks about the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, names of the tribes of Israel. Clearly what you're seeing in Revelation 21. Now, this is where you got to make a decision. What did Jesus say in Matthew 5, 17? I'm not come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Fulfill prophets? Yes. Oh, is Ezekiel a prophet? Yes. So let me ask you, did he fulfill it or not? You're going to have to make that, you're going to have to make that decision. He either fulfilled it or he didn't. I've made the decision. He fulfilled it. That's what Revelation 21 is telling us. And that's what this is telling us, by the way. What else? Luke 21, 32. Verily I say unto you, Jesus says, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Now here he says everything. So is Ezekiel part of the everything? Yes. Did you just see the gates? Yes. Is it fulfilled or not? I say yes. You're going to have to make that decision. My decision's in. Luke 24, 44. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you, Jesus says, while I was yet with you that all things must be, what? Fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Now, is the holy city and the tribes of Israel and the holy nation that's being depicted, does that concern Jesus? <laughs> I'm going to suggest to you him being the chief cornerstone, right? Of the holy nation, the spiritual house, where the Lord is there, right? Because you are the building, if you will. We're supposed to understand that that indeed was established in the first century. And that's what Jesus is saying. Okay, so you're gonna have to make the decision. Is Ezekiel 48 fulfilled? If your answer is, well, yeah, it must be because Jesus said prophets will be fulfilled. Well, you're seeing the tribes of Israel there and the gates four times three. And that's what you're seeing here, folks. Okay, so... There's that. I think I've done a pretty good job there, at least at making my case. And now we're going to hit verse 14. Okay, so this will be the last verse for Revelation 21. This is part three of it. And it says, And the wall of the city, we talked about this briefly already, had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. All right. What we know for sure is that's not us. Therefore, it's them. You're going to have to decide, are they the foundation? Because the way Paul was talking, he was talking present tense. I have laid the foundation. He didn't say, one day I'll lay the foundation. No, he said, I have, right? And that's what's being described here. 
So if he did it, and that's what's being described here, then that means they did it, and that's what this is describing. Therefore, fulfilled. So, do I have any scriptures to further back this up? Well, I'm going to remind you what it said in 1 Corinthians 3, 9 to 11. We are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry, yet you are, present tense, God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Not I will, I have. And he's saying that back then. And another buildeth thereon. All right? But let every man take heed how he builds. And then he says, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid. It's our, the chief cornerstone, Jesus the Messiah, is already established, seated at the right hand of the Father. That's what you're seeing in Revelation 21. Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but instead your fellow citizens with the saints. Notice here's the saints and with the saints. See? And I'd like to think that we're fellow citizens of the previous fellow citizens that are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And I hope and pray that more people in my generation and future generations become uh, a really, really full, a fully inherited part of the household of God. That's what we're shooting for here, I think. And look at, he says it here, very straightforward, and are built upon the foundation of what? And it's are, by the way, present tense, are built upon the foundation of the apostles. What did we just see in Revelation 21, verse 14? The names of the 12 apostles in the foundation. And he's talking present tense here in the book of Ephesians in the first century. So is it fulfilled or not? Is the foundation of the apostles there or not? Because then what are we talking about? If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be doing this Bible study right now. We know this. Therefore, Revelation 21, historical and fulfilled, are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And understand they did have in that first century, there were prophets in that first century prophesying as well. And prophets, by the way, have multitudes of, of things to take care of. But Making the point that the foundation of the of the twelve apostles in Revelation twenty one, Paul saying the exact same thing here in Ephesians two, so no one would deny. Oh yeah, they laid the foundation. Okay, then why are you saying Revelation twenty one is in the future? Then, if it's the same foundation and they did their job, and you're claiming they did their job, why do you keep saying Revelation twenty one is for the future? That doesn't make any sense. You're saying both. That doesn't make any sense. Not to me. And he says Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple of the Lord. You're seeing this building, the spiritual house, the spiritual kingdom that does not come with observation, right? That the first century saints, along, of course, with Christ being the chief cornerstone, established. Of course, God arranged all this. This is great. In whom you also are builded together. See how he's saying, hey, and by the way, new guys are builded together. See how he says, right? It's Christ, then the foundation, the apostles, and then the prophets, right? And now, and by the way, and you guys too, right? And, and so that continues. For an habitation of God. How though? Through the Spirit. Through the Spirit. Okay? So hopefully you're seeing that. All right. And I'm going to leave you today with this, because again, we're, we're dealing with this wonderful scripture here that the wall of the city had 12 foundations and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb, which points to its timeline being in the first century and completed and established. And they did such a good job, by the way. God, through Christ and the apostles and the prophets of the first century, and then the continuing peoples after that, did such a good job that here we are approximately 2,000 years later, assuming our chronology is fairly accurate, and we still have Jesus, our mediator, seated at the right hand of the Father. And we're still talking about it. We're still preaching it. We're still teaching it. We're still discipling people. And we're still called to do exactly what the first century folks were called to do. All right? So I'm going to leave you with this to remind you that it's a spiritual kingdom, not one on earth. And therefore, therefore... Not a physical one on earth. It's not. Therefore, we should be thinking this way through the Spirit. Okay? Not just saying it. We need to 
fully, fully embrace that position because as soon as you make it a physical nation, now that's carnal. That's what it is. And you want to see it in person, right? Jesus said in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you in my father's house. He didn't say, but just temporarily, and then I'm going to come back here. He didn't say that. He said, so that where I am, you will also be. It's not that he's coming back here physically. It's that we're going to him spiritually. Okay. And I understand that there's an earthly land and I'm happy. I'm happy. I mean, Egypt, there's a place called Egypt today. I'm happy that they have their nation. I, I'm glad when anybody has somewhere to live, but it doesn't change the spiritual kingdom that Christ came to establish. It doesn't change that. Okay. And so we need to stay in that, in that kind of frame of mind, frame of soul, frame of spirit and frame of faith and belief. Okay. And I'm going to encourage you because I think this is a beautiful piece of scripture. But you, he's speaking to the believers at that time, are come unto what? Mount Sion. And what happened in Revelation 21 at the front end of this? He carried me away in the spirit to what? A great and high mountain. A great and high mountain. What do you see here? But you are come unto Mount Sion. And what does he say next? Unto the city of the living God. What do you see here in Revelation 21? What did he show you? What did he say? That great city, right? So you see a mountain, then you see a great city. Then he says, the heavenly Jerusalem, not the earthly one, folks. That never changes. That never changes, okay? Because the corruption right? The decaying still occurs here. That doesn't change, right? This Jerusalem is one that does not decay. The inheritance is one that does not decay. There's no corruptible crowns in the spiritual kingdom. Those are here. Those are here. This is a heavenly Jerusalem. And what do you see in Revelation 21 here? You see the holy Jerusalem. Okay. Then he says, to an innumerable company of angels. Well, I don't mind telling you, do I really need to go through the book of Revelation and show you how many angels are there? <laughs> I don't think I have to. I don't think I have to. To the general assembly and church of who? The firstborn. Who's the firstborn, first begotten of the dead, if you will? Jesus, the Christ, right? And which, so you, you, you are come unto that Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly in the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. That's where you're written. Why? Because that's your home. That's your home. That's your home. That's your ultimate home and destination. And to God, the judge of all, you go to God. You see that? The judge of all, Right? And to the spirits of just men made perfect. Where's that? Uh, I'm pretty sure you're going to agree with me. That has to be the heavenly Jerusalem. <laughs> I think you're going to agree with me there. And to Jesus, the mediator of what? The new covenant. And notice he's speaking in present tense to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. That's who you've come to. The new covenant. There's no promise of a new improved new covenant. <laughs> no, that's the one that he did and did finish the work in the first century and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. All right. So guys, Revelation 21 is all about, I'm going to suggest to you the new covenant, the new covenant church that was established in the first century. God established it as he promised through Christ, Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah, and through Christ to the apostles who preached it, right? They received the spirit at the Feast of Pentecost. They added thousands of people right out the gate and they established those first century churches that continued to preach the good news about the mediator and about how God saved us through the spirit of Christ, right? And we have hope, resurrection hope. 
And that's continued ever since. And that's what verses 9 to 14 is describing. All right? So thank you guys for listening to this teaching. If nothing else, I just hope that I've helped you at least strongly consider, strongly consider that if Revelation 21 is indeed about the establishment of the first century church, then Revelation 21 is fulfilled. And if Revelation 21 is fulfilled, then Revelation 20 is fulfilled. And I'm going to suggest strongly, if we're already midway through chapter 21 and we're seeing fulfillment, fulfillment, fulfillment in the first century, I'm going to suggest to you and urge you to at least strongly consider that indeed the entire book of Revelation is about the historical success of God and Christ and the saints of the first century. And it's a book that is about the birth of Christ and his ministry, and, and of course, the apostles taking it from there, and of course, the ending of the Mosaic law by Christ fulfilling all things, and in the destruction of Jerusalem, Israel, and the temple, ending that Mosaic law, and through the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, and ushering in that new covenant that we are enjoying today. And so we can look at the book of Revelation as historical accomplished and we can glean from it and we can shine the light that Christ instructed at that time and that we are being instructed through the Spirit to continue to do so that we might be a light to other people in our lives and maybe if we can gather enough light, maybe even to other nations, which would be fantastic. And I'm going to suggest to you that that's what we're called to do. So let's tune into his voice. Let's be prayerful. God bless you all for listening. Thank you so much. Grace and peace.